victors through him who loved you. You're victors in Christ. Now listen, I know that we, we shared an awful lot of information here and just condensed it into 40 minutes. This is something, if we were teaching this in evening classes, I would take two nights, I would take three hours to go through all this. So you may need to grab the CD and listen to this again. But if you can just get a hold of just some of these wisdom principles that we laid out, God will fill in the blanks. God will tailor that. The Holy Spirit will tailor that to meet you. 10. The Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful towards this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me. Paul says, pray for me that utterance may be given to me so that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel." We've been sharing for a few weeks about things unseen. The Bible says that what we can see is only temporary, but oddly enough to us, what we cannot see is eternal. So we've been taking some time this summer to fix our eyes on things that are unseen. And today we're going to share with you about spiritual warfare, about spiritual warfare. Church, as we discuss this topic, we want to give you two quick cautions. First, we need to know that God does not want us to be afraid to talk about these matters. How many of you know that some people are reluctant or even frightened to talk about spiritual things or to talk about the enemy of our souls? God does not want us to be fearful concerning our adversary. Jesus said, Behold, I am giving you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Praise the Lord. A second caution is that God does not want us to be naive. Don't hide your head in the sand concerning the devil. The Apostle Paul says we're not ignorant of his devices, meaning his schemes and his thinking. So it's important to know that God doesn't want us to be either afraid or naive. And with those thoughts in mind, we're going to share with you on this topic, Christians in combat. Christians in combat. Let's pray and ask God's help as we look into his word today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the great name of Jesus, and we thank you for giving us your word. It's a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we pray that you would touch our hearts right now, that our hearts would be good soil, that we can receive and retain the seed of the word of God, and, Lord, bear good fruit from it. Jesus said that his words were spirit and life. So, Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to us now and minister that life from Jesus out of the word to us. And we ask you also for the help of your holy angels, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the last 20 years or so, the term spiritual warfare has become very common in churches around the world. Some people aren't quite sure what to make of it, while others have made it a major emphasis in their lives. Should Christians be concerned about demonic spirits? How much attention should we give to the spiritual realm, to the spiritual arena? Everybody seems to have an opinion about spiritual warfare. How should we do spiritual warfare and who is capable of doing it? Some of the confusion about this among Christians probably comes from the enemy himself. And there is a wonderful quote about this from the great author C.S. Lewis. If you're not sure who C.S. Lewis was, C.S. Lewis was Narnia. The other guy was Lord of the Rings. All right, that's, that's who he is. 
But C.S. Lewis said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, the human race, can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. That's pretty good. Satan will trick us however he can. Why? Because he does not want us to learn how to destroy his works. The Bible says that for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil and Satan says that he does not want us to learn how to do the same. But maybe we can cut through some of the noise of people's opinions if we can arrive at a simple but biblical definition of what spiritual warfare actually is. So I'd like to suggest for us a definition of spiritual warfare that may help us to get a handle on it. And it's very simple. My definition is simply this. Engaging the enemy with the power of Christ under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Very simple. Let's boil it down to uh, its simplest essence. Engaging the enemy with the power of Christ under the leading of the Holy Spirit. That's spiritual warfare. Now, the thought of engaging the enemy would cause some people to have questions pop up in their minds right away. The first question that people ask is, well, are people really under assault from demonic spirits? Can we actually be under a spiritual attack? Well, the Bible doesn't spend time trying to convince you one way or the other. The Bible simply assumes that the devil and his armies are seeking to afflict human beings. That's an unpleasant reality, but that is what the Bible says to us. Throughout the New Testament, we see demons harassing people. And I want you to know that ancient peoples, the peoples of the ancient world, did not believe in that because they were scientifically primitive. You might have been told that they were primitive, but they were not. Just because they did not have an iPhone, they knew certain things. They knew, for example, that virgins don't have babies, right? So uh, just because they were scientifically primitive, they were not foolish. Nor did they think that demons were responsible for every sickness that people have. For example, the Gospels do clearly say, as you study the ministry of Jesus, there were some cases of epilepsy that were caused by demons, and there were some cases of epilepsy that were not caused by demons. And we've talked about the fact that the devil is very real. He's not the figment of some Hollywood screenwriter's imagination. Jesus Christ believed in demonic infestation. He taught about it, and he rescued people from it. And today... Our tendency is to emphasize the Lord's teachings, and we should do that. But the Apostle Peter knew that that was only part of the story of what Jesus' ministry was all about. Peter described the ministry of Jesus in a different way from the way that we would probably describe it. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter was preaching, he said this about the ministry of Jesus. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. Peter thought that that was an important component of Jesus' ministry. Setting people free from demonic affliction which nowadays we usually call the ministry of deliverance, that was an essential part of Jesus' ministry. Did you know that one-fourth or more of Jesus' ministry in the Gospels involved casting demons out of people? One-fourth or more of his ministry. And should Christians expect to have conflict against demonic spirits? Or is it only people who don't serve the Lord? Well, Peter says to us in his first letter, he says, Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And who did he write that to? He wrote that not to the world, but he wrote that to the church. So we have to conclude that we may also face some forms of attack from demonic spirits. A second question people will ask about spiritual warfare is this. Are Christians called to engage in spiritual warfare? Are the followers of Jesus really meant to battle against demonic forces? The Bible indicates that we are. In our passage of Scripture in Ephesians 6, which we read, Paul says our struggle, and literally it's our wrestling match, is not against flesh and blood. If Paul used that form of language, then certainly he thought that we were in a battle. Friends, Christianity 
is an aggressive faith. But the war that we're engaged in as Christians is not a war against other people. It's not a war of politics. It's not a war against society at large. It's a war against spiritual opponents. It's a war against the wicked spirits who serve the kingdom of Satan as he rebels against God. Paul's very blunt. He says we are wrestling. That is the word that was lifted by Paul directly out of the world of sports. It was the ordinary, everyday Greek language word for a wrestling match. And if you've ever done any wrestling, we have any former wrestlers in the house? <laughs> I see that young lady back there who is, she probably does with her brother, amen. <laughs> if you ever spend any time wrestling, then you know that there's grappling involved. You watch these guys going at it on TV. It's hard, sweaty work. And Paul says, this is what our combat is like. It's not a little brief brush with the enemy. It's a wrestling match. But people also ask a third question, and it's this. Who is it that can engage in spiritual warfare? Who can do this anyway? Who's qualified to do these things? Well, this question is easier perhaps to answer. Not only did Jesus battle against these forces, but Jesus said that you and I would do so also. Before Jesus ascended, he said to his friends, just as the Father has sent me, so now he said, I am sending you. You are being sent out in the same way as the Father sent out Jesus. Jesus was clear. Wow is right. Jesus was clear. Our mission is not just to demonstrate his love, but our mission is to do his works also. Only when we do the works of Jesus will people fully see who he is. And I'm not speaking of works of mercy so much. We need to do those things. But people need to see that Jesus Christ has power to set people free. The ability to cast out demons, the ability to heal sick people in his name is proof that there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that God has given him a name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. And the ability to cast out demonic spirits in Jesus' name is proof to the world. Listen, the devil doesn't need that proof. He's well aware. It's proof to the world that the name of Jesus has been invested with authority from heaven. Paul said to the church at Corinth, he said, My speech and my preaching to you, they were not with clever words of man's wisdom, but they came in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Church, the kingdom of God, the Bible says, it is not a matter, it is not a thing of talk. It is a thing of power. And so Jesus not only cast out demons, but he prepared his followers to do the very same. As he trained his disciples, Jesus released his authority to them. First, the twelve. And then a larger group of disciples that we refer to as the seventy. And then finally, all believers were authorized by Jesus to continue on his ministry of deliverance. When he sent out the 12 on one of their training missions, Luke records that it says this, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Over in the next chapter in Luke 10, a little later when he sent out the 70, it says this, the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. Now, why did they say that? The reason they said it that way was because when Jesus sent the 70 out on their mission, he did not specifically mention demons when he commissioned them to go out. But they came back and said, Lord, because of your name, we even have power over the demons. But you see, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave that authority to the entire church. In Mark 16, before Jesus ascended, he said, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Everybody say, believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. In other words, these signs will not just follow pastors. They will not follow 
blue-haired grandmothers who have been Christians for 50 years. They will not follow that strange person that reads up on this stuff all the time. That's not me. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> Jesus said they will follow, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. And he gave all believers the power to carry on his mission of expelling demonic invaders. Indeed, the church did for several centuries after the time of Christ. For several centuries, in the years of the early Roman Empire, the church carried on a powerful deliverance ministry. There's a book by a Yale University professor of history, a man who is not a believer. He's not an evangelical believer. He's a Yale University professor of history. And this man said that casting out of demons was the key factor in evangelism in the early Roman Empire. Do you know that in the early church, the Christians boasted publicly that they could cast out demons to people? And in the early church, the Christians even boasted publicly that their little children could cast demons out of people. So who can be used to set people free? All of us. Church, be confident. Demonic powers are real, but you've been called to overcome them through the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be victorious in spiritual combat. God wants every one of you to be able to fulfill that definition of spiritual warfare I gave you a moment ago, which is to engage the enemy with the power of Christ under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, it's one thing to find out that you've been drafted into God's army, but it's another thing to become a trained warrior. So we need to find some keys that will help us to become better fighters. I see three things here in Ephesians that Paul says will help us to prevail in spiritual warfare. I want to share them with you. The first one is this. Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. I was going to wear that today, but my wife talked me out of it. So back to black I go. Ephesians 6.10 is one of the best known phrases in the entire Bible, right? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But what does it mean to be strong in the Lord? The first thing it certainly means is this. Don't fight the enemy in your own strength. You are no match for the devil on your own. He's stronger than you. He's more clever than you. He's older than you. So scripture gives us clear advice. Seek strength from God. We need to be humble enough to admit that if we're going to win, we're going to need not a little help. We're going to need a lot of help. Amen. But there's another meaning to this passage, and it's very important. Because in the original Greek, these words, be strong in the Lord, should have been translated this way. Be strengthened in the Lord or receive strength in the Lord. See, it's, it was not active. It was passive. In other words, it's not about being brave, right? Sometimes uh, people think when they say, be strong in the Lord, that they're telling you, just kind of be brave. Just kind of clench your teeth, grit your teeth, and you'll get through. But it's not about being brave or making yourself strong. It's about receiving something. It's about making yourself receive strength from the Lord. It's something that we've misunderstood for generations because of how it was translated in our English Bibles. In Greek, this word, be strong, it's the word endunamao. Now, there won't be a quiz later. I'm not sure I can say that again. But endunamao means let power come into you. It doesn't mean work yourself into a state of courage. It means allow dunamis, which is power, allow power to come into you. And that's a very different thing, isn't it? That dunamis power, it's the active power of God. It's the same power that flowed out of Jesus when people touched him. You remember the story of the woman who had a hemorrhage, and when she touched Jesus in faith, Jesus stopped, and he said, who touched me? He said, because I can feel that power, dunamis, has come out of me. And that's the word that's being used here. To be strengthened in the Lord means that he is causing power to flow into us and give us strength for spiritual combat. 
So now what Paul said, you see, is very different. Finally, Paul says, finally, my brothers, receive strength from the Lord in Christ and in the power of his might. And we can receive that strength in our own spirits, but in order to do so, we will have to present our spirits to the Lord so that he can fill them with his might. How can we do this? First, connect with God in his word. Connect with God in his word. Christians need to be encouraged to know that Bible reading is not an intellectual exercise. It's a spiritual exercise. One of the things that pastors hear people say most frequently is this, Pastor, I can't read the Bible, I can't study the Bible because I was never good in school. I was never good with reading, things like that. We hear this an awful lot. But you know, it's not about intellectual learning. It's about having the life of God that is inside the Bible saturate your being. Don't misunderstand me, please. Don't, don't go home and say, Pastor Nick said today that we shouldn't study the Bible. That's not what I'm saying at all. We should study the scriptures, and we need to learn the scriptures very well, as well as we can. But we need to look at the Bible as food for our souls and not just look at it as information. See what happened? God breathed life into his word. And when we spend time in the word, you know what happened? The Holy Spirit blows back. He breathes that life out of the word back into us. So keep reading it, even if you don't understand all of it. Even if you can't quite figure out who is Mephibosheth and why are they going over that river again for the 10th time? You know what? Even if you don't understand all those things, Keep reading the Word of God. Listen to the Word of God on CD. Let it fill your heart. It will change you. The second, you need a life of worship that helps you to encounter God's presence. That's why we need to be in church. That's why we need to be in worship together as a family. Don't miss song number one and song number two. They're usually pretty good. You know. You know how that goes. How was church today? Church was great. How was the worship? I, I don't know. Right? We're, I don't have to say that to the 10 o'clock crowd, right? But we need to be here and we need to lift our voice to God in praise. There is no substitute for praising together with the people of God. See, David said, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart and I will enter his courts with praise. Worship is the way into God's empowering presence. You know, being in God's presence will empower you. And being in worship is the way to enter his empowering presence. Third, we need to make times to pray and seek God, as the old expression goes, in our closet. You need to have that little place where you go and be alone with God and seek him there in your closet. We need to have times when we're not just asking God for things but where we're sitting quietly before him, just talking to him one-on-one. -on -one. We need to seek his face and let his glory transform us. We need his holy presence. Paul also tells us in Ephesians that we need to specifically ask him for power. In Ephesians 5, he says, for us to be constantly being filled, be constantly getting filled with the Spirit. And getting filled with the Spirit does not happen by accident. It happens because we are asking for it. We need to go to God every day and say, Father, fill me with your spirit. That's your homework for this week. I want you to think of this like American Express. You don't leave home without it, right? We should never leave our homes a single day without asking God, fill me with your spirit for today, for the challenges, for what's coming at me. And just because I love you, Lord, and I want to be with you, fill me with your spirit today. Don't rely on your own strength. God says it's not by might or power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And we need to go to him for that. Three things that can help us prevail in spiritual warfare. The first one is be strong in the Lord. The second one is this, learn how to get dressed. Learn how to get dressed. Ephesians 6 contains the very famous illustration of the armor of God. And you know the armor of God is a subject that has been the topic of a thousand sermons and probably a million Sunday school lessons, right? But we can't understand that armor if we read this chapter of Ephesians 6 out of context. We can't understand Ephesians 6 unless we also look at the five chapters that come in front of it. 
Church, I want you to hear my heart today. The armor is very important for us. But perhaps the armor of God is not our most important clothing. To learn about our most important clothing, we need chapters 1 to 5. The clothing we need to think about first is what God has called us to wear underneath our armor. You see, in Revelation 19, it says this, The church was clothed in fine linen, clean and white, because the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. We've been called first to wear righteousness and to wear purity. In order to wear the armor of God properly, we need to put on that pure linen from God. Before we ever get to the armor of God, Paul takes five chapters to talk to us about some areas where we need to check our robes to see how clean and bright they really are. First is the area of the church. In chapter four, four Paul addresses the unity of the church. He says, work hard, he says, to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So we need to check our hearts and see if we are really working hard to be at peace with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Second area that's on Paul's heart in Ephesians is the home. You know, some people want to be on the front lines of ministry. They want to be on the front lines of spiritual warfare, but their homes are in disorder. Paul gives instructions in Ephesians on how we should treat one another in our families. See, the enemy has a lot of room to attack in your family when he sees that family members are not treating each other with honor and with respect. Paul also talks in Ephesians about our behavior in the workplace. What kind of employees, or if you're an employer, what kind of employers are we? You know, they have these shows on TV now, maybe you've seen them, where these guys come in undercover and they film people in the workplace. Have you seen this? Man, I am never going to any restaurant ever again, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, we have to ask the question, what would we do, how would we fare if someone came to our workplace undercover and filmed us undercover. You know, you know that guy at work, he has the three hour lunch followed by Facebook and solitaire. <laughs> you work with that guy? I hope it's not you. You know, it's a, it's a guy you work with. It couldn't be us, right? And before he ever gets to the armor, Paul also talks about sexual purity. He says that sexual sin should not even be mentioned once among Christian people, and yet we know that it is something that some Christian people struggle with. May God give us the grace to walk in purity. One of the most important things that Paul mentions in Ephesians before he even gets to that armor is the question of unforgiveness. He says in chapter 4, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You know, if God forgave me everything that I, could, that I have done, Paul says, how can I not forgive you? Because of Jesus. Holding a grudge will short circuit your spiritual life. You know, a few times these past a couple of weeks, I've quoted the line, the verse about not being ignorant of Satan's devices. And you know, the context of that story is actually about unforgiveness. Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and he said, I'm concerned that you guys are okay about this issue of unforgiveness, he says, because we don't want Satan to take advantage of us, he says, because we're not ignorant of how he operates. And it had to do specifically with unforgiveness. Unforgiveness will disqualify you for spiritual combat. God wants us to be successful in warfare. But I think unless we're wearing those pure garments underneath, we won't be nearly as effective in battle. Three things to help us prevail in spiritual warfare. Number one was to be strong in the Lord. Number two is learning how to get dressed. And finally this, number three, stand your ground and fight. God wants you to stand your ground and fight. I remember that uh, years ago, Pastor David Wilkerson had a book and it was entitled, Have You Felt Like Giving Up Lately? God wants you to stand and to fight. We don't have time to explore today the various parts of the armor of God. You know, there's lots of good teaching resources on that topic that we could point you to. 
But in the few minutes that we have, I think the main thing God wants you to know about the armor of God is that it's from God. The armor of God is from God. What do you mean? In other words, God wants you to know that he has given you protection and he has given you equipment that is sufficient to enable you to overcome in any battle, in any circumstance. Praise the Lord. His power is more than enough to help you to get through anything. Paul says, take up that whole armor of God, and in the middle of the evil day, you will still be standing. How many of you know that there are some days that come through our lives which are an evil day? But God has power which is sufficient to cause you to be still standing at the end of the evil day. And because God knows that he has all power and he has your back and he's given you his armor, he calls us to be courageous and be willing to engage the enemy in combat. Paul says, withstand him, do everything you can, stand and then stand again. I don't know about you, but it sounds like he wants you to stand. God wants you to stand and fight in three separate battlegrounds. The first battleground we see here is the battleground of the heavenly places. The battleground of heavenly places. Now you've got to put your thinking caps on here with me. Paul says that we wrestle against wicked spirits in heavenly places, and we mentioned them last time. Now, in order to understand this kind of warfare, we have to understand a little bit about what the Bible calls heavenly places. Now, keep your thinking caps on. For us, in our culture, heaven is where God lives. Heaven is where God lives. That's how we use the word heaven in English. What is heaven? Or I'm going to heaven, things like this. But in the Hebrew mind, there are multiple heavens. In the Hebrew mind, there is more than one heaven. In Hebrew... The word heaven simply means an expanse of space. It is a place that is lifted up. That's what heaven, the word heaven in Hebrew means something that has been lifted up over your head. And in the Bible, there are actually three heavens that we read about. These three heavens are different realms or spaces where spiritual activity happens. If you want to be modern and scientific, we would say that these Three heavens are three dimensions of reality where spiritual things take place. What are these three heavens or heavenly places? Well, the first one is easy because you can lift up your head and look at it. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. And it includes what in English we call the sky and also what in English we call outer space. Now, in Hebrew thinking, the birds are not called the birds of the air. But in Hebrew, the birds are called the birds of heaven. That's just the way that they conceive of it in their culture. We, we know that birds don't fly to the throne of God in the morning and come back, right? But that's how they think of it. Here's a heaven, the sky, and space, and then there are heavens above that. What is the third heaven? The third heaven is what we usually mean in English when we say heaven. In other words, the place of God's dwelling. Paul referred to the dwelling place of God as the third heaven. You may remember that Paul was stoned and left for dead. Paul said that he was taken up into the third heaven and he had spiritual experiences there. He wasn't sure if, it, if his body was actually caught up, if he was in the body or if he was out of the body and just saw it in a vision. He says he wasn't sure. And there are other prophets and apostles who were caught up there as well. But that leaves us a mystery. Okay, we know what the first heaven is, and we know what the third heaven is, but what's in the middle? So we have this mystery of what the second heaven might be. Now, in Ephesians 2, Paul called Satan the prince of the power of what? The air. The prince of the power of the air. Satan and his princes are active in this in-between space, if you want to call it that, between the earth and and the third heaven, the heaven of God. Last week, we saw how God had sent an angel to Daniel, in the book of Daniel. God sent an angel to the prophet Daniel, and on the way to Daniel, that angel was resisted by the demonic prince of Persia. 
And then when he left, the angel says, on my way out, I'm going to have another fight with the demonic prince of Greece. Battles like that, spiritual combat in the heavenly places, take place in the second heaven. How do we wage war in that arena, if we do at all? Making war against these powerful beings in the heavenlies is not the same thing as fighting demons who afflict us here on the earth. Now, again, stay with me here because this is some things in the scripture that you might have not dug into too deeply. But demons can be cast out of people. But warfare against high-level demonic princes is entirely different. If you don't think that's true, then uh, drive down the Major Deegan and look at the city and take authority over all the evil of the city and just command it to leave and see if it does. <laughs> You're dealing with an entirely different category of warfare. That's a very big topic, and if you want to study, you can get more notes on that. We've taught about that in our Equip course, uh, course on spiritual warfare, and you can have access to those notes. But let me tell you this much, church. The church fights in the heavenly realms mainly through intercession, through intercession, through sustained prayer over time like Daniel did. When we make intercession for our region, how many of you would, would say that you have a burden on your heart that God has you in your life as someone who feels a call to pray for your region? You have a special burden. In your times of prayer with the Lord, see, some of you know what I'm talking about. You have a burden that you constantly find yourself wanting to pray for your city, for your town, for uh, these things. When we make intercession for our region, God acts. He acts sovereignly, and he acts through his angels to weaken the hold of evil, to weaken those principalities and powers. Church, this is why praying for your region, be it the nation, be it the state, be it your city, what have you, prayer for your region is vitally important. It's vitally important. The Bible teaches us that this kind of praying sometimes can determine, can even determine the success or the failure of the gospel in a certain place. Do you know that Paul told the Thessalonian church, it may seem strange to you, but Paul told the, the Thessalonian church that he had been hindered in his mission by Satan. You may not like that, but that's the reality. Thank God it was more frequent for Paul to say that God had given him an open door. Why? Because people were praying. Isn't it interesting how Paul finishes the section of our text that we read when he talks about the armor and he says, and while you're praying all that, make sure you pray for me so that I may have utterance, that I may have ability and opportunity to speak. In South Korea, Pastor David Cho, you know, he has a little struggling church of 800,000 people. And Pastor Cho says that there was revival in Korea. Why? He says it was because the powers of the heavens were broken through prayer. I'd like to see that here, amen? And in Ephesians 6, we're commanded by God there to pray the word of God and to pray all kinds of prayer in the spirit. Paul asked the church to pray so that he could, he said, make known to people the mystery of the gospel. They wrestled in prayer against these territorial spirits so that the gospel would spread. But church, we need to be careful how we pray. If you mention these princes at all, you should be asking God to deal with them, not directly challenging them yourself. Don't go around cursing Satan or cursing principalities. We don't see this behavior in the scriptures. Um, I hear people praying all kinds of ways and praying all kinds of things. I don't know if you uh, think that we can curse the devil any more than what God has already cursed. Think about it. Sometimes we need to think a little bit about what it is we're actually saying in prayer. But we don't find any, uh, any of that kind of behavior in scriptural praying. Tackling principalities is not a task for individuals. It is a job for the united church in a region. It's very rare that God calls the church to speak to these beings directly unless he communicates that to the leadership in a region. Sometimes God calls a church to um, repent for the sins of an area or the sins of a territory the way that Daniel did. You can read about that in Daniel 9. Daniel made repentance for the sins of Israel. And those things can weaken the grip of the demonic princes in a territory. 
My concern is that Christians who don't walk according to wisdom in these things can leave themselves open to the attack of these enemies, which are vastly more powerful than the demons we see in the Gospels, who are really just the foot soldiers of the enemy's army. Another concern that we need to express in this regard is that being healthy about spiritual warfare means that we don't focus too much on the devil. Not because we're afraid of the devil, but because our focus is Christ. Our focus is the purposes of God. And if we pray the purposes of God instead of praying about what the devil is doing, then God can keep us in safety. God can keep your heart in peace, and he'll guard you in his secret place in Christ. Too many of us as believers focus our prayer time on what they see the devil doing. You understand me. Your praying can become very reactive if your prayer life is driven by what you observe the devil's activity to be. It's so much better to pray about what God has said he will do. See, Jesus said, I am the one who opens and nobody can shut. And I am the one who shuts and nobody can open. So if I pray to God to open a door for the gospel, who can stop God from opening a door for the gospel? That's good preaching right there. You may need to get the CD and listen to that again. That's the battleground of the heavenly places. Another battleground where God's going to help you to stand and fight is the battleground of this world. We've already talked about how Jesus modeled deliverance ministry and how we're called to imitate him in that. The media loves to talk about exorcism. It's, it's always out there in the media, and in case you haven't noticed, they put out a new, I think they put out a new horror movie about exorcism about once a month. <laughs> Number one movie in the country. But exorcists use rituals and they use ceremonies that Christians do not need to utilize. Jesus said that demons would simply be cast out with a word. He did it that way, and Paul also cast out the demons by simply commanding them to leave in the name of Jesus. Here at Harvest Time, we also, we have a deliverance ministry that seeks to minister with dignity to people who are being harassed by the enemy. It's important to recognize, though, church, that most of the problems in our Christian lives are not caused by demons. I know that's a convenient excuse, but most of our problems are growth issues in our own lives. They're matters of discipleship. They are matters of our personal integrity and our obedience to the word of God. Blaming the devil is easier than pointing the blame at this guy, isn't it? And temptation has to be overcome. Sin is not a demon. How many of you know that you can't cast out the flesh? Right? I take authority over this vile cheesecake. And I rebuke these calories in the name of the Lord. <laughs> and you could drive down to the mall and you could try that, but it's not going to work. No, the flesh has to be crucified and kept under. But engaging in sin and indulging the flesh can allow the enemy to get a foothold in your life. So to keep that door from opening for the enemy, we need to avoid behaviors that can turn your life into the devil's playground. Avoid sexual sin and sexual perversion. Avoid witchcraft and the occult. Avoid mind-altering drugs. Avoid that sin we talked about of unforgiveness because those things invite the enemy in and they give him a legal right to just operate in your life. Christians, uh, don't read your horrible scope. <laughs> what is astrology? What is your horoscope? Your horoscope is advice, counsel, and guidance from a demonic spirit. Isn't it? You have the Holy Spirit from God to give you advice and counsel and guidance for your life. Just as flies are drawn to garbage, all of those things attract demonic spirits. But thank God people who are being harassed by demons can be freed through the name of Jesus Christ. God helps us to fight in the heavenlies and to fight in this world too. And as we close today, let's look at one final battleground where God says he wants to help us to stand and fight. And that's the battleground of our own hearts. The battleground of our own hearts. Elizabeth, you can come if you would. 
Paul says, put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil, against his tricks. You need his armor to protect you because you are facing an opponent who is seeking to demoralize you. Demoralize you. You might have noticed that many of the pieces of the armor of God really have to do with defeating the condemnation in your heart that the devil is trying to put on you. How many of you know that if the enemy can get you to start to feel discouraged or condemned, he has already won because he knows that if you feel condemned, you will throw in the towel and you will give up the fight. Do you know today that you have the helmet of salvation and that you're really saved? Do you know that you're the righteousness of God in Christ? If you don't know that, then the devil will come at you with condemnation and with discouragement. See, he tries to tell you, oh, God doesn't love you anymore. He tries to tell you, well, you're not really saved. And of course, the one we hear all the time from people, he tries to tell you that you've committed the unpardonable sin. You haven't committed the unpardonable sin. If you still care, if you're still worried that you have, then that means that you haven't because it means that the Holy Spirit is still working on you. And that is a lie from the devil that God has used to torment thousands of souls down through time. He tries to tell you that God has given up on you and that everybody hates you, especially the people at church. That's what he wants you to think. You know, our fears... The fears in our mind can be so strong that if we heard them coming out of somebody else's mouth, we would say, that person is really being irrational. What they're saying doesn't make any sense. But when those fears are our fears, they sound very reasonable to us. That's the work of the enemy. He comes at you with those fiery darts that the scripture passage talked about. And we need to hold up the shield of faith to knock those things down. The devil says, you're not going to make it. You might as well give up. Or he spreads poisonous doctrines and gets people absorbed with strange teachings to damage their faith. You need to know the word of God, church, in order so that you can counter Satan's blows and then strike back at him hard. When the devil comes at you with temptations, you need to know how to use the scriptures the way that Jesus did. You need to know how to answer him with the word of God so you can say, like Jesus said to him, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written, and overcome. It'll happen for you just like it happened with the Lord. It said the devil left and waited for another opportune time. Why? Because he doesn't want to hear the word of God spoken in faith. You need to take the helmet of salvation and know that because of Jesus' blood, you are accepted by God today. You need to put on the breastplate of righteousness and know that Jesus was made sin for you and that now your name has been written down in heaven. Amen. You need to put on the belt of truth so that you won't be deceived and ashamed. You need to know that the gospel has made peace between you and God. And while there might have been a time when you were the enemy of God, today you are the friend of God. Put on the whole armor of God and you can prevail in any battle anywhere. Maybe a battle in the quiet of your heart that you're facing temptation. It may be a battle against harassing spirits or the wild circumstances of your life. Who knows, it may even be a crazy experience in the heavenly places like it was for Daniel. But what I do know is that Jesus has all authority and all power, enough to enable you to overcome in any dimension, in any place, in any sphere of life, enough for you to survive any attack and come out as more than a conqueror in any situation. You can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can be a victorious Christian in combat and you can prevail in your fight as you engage the enemy with the power of Christ under the leading of the spirit. Church, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And after you've done everything to stand, at the end of the day, you're going to win and you're going to be more than a conqueror in him. Come on, let's stand up and give Jesus a tremendous praise in this house. Come on, come on, somebody applaud the Lord and give him blessing. 
Give him praise. Give him glory. Praise him for the strength that he gives his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to pray today for fresh strength and fresh power. We've got a few minutes left, and I want to invite you to slip out of your seat and come down to this altar and pray with me. I want you to come if you feel a little bit worn out or if you're feeling a little defeated. You can just come now. Make sure you fill in all the spaces so that others can get in. And I want you to come to this altar even if there's nothing wrong with you today, but you just know that you need more of God's strength. You know, you don't have to have something wrong or terrible in your life to come to the altar and seek God. And I want you to come even if there's no major problem that's taking place in your heart. But if you just know that you need the strength of God in your life. And while we're coming, just fill in as much space as you can. You can move all the way up to the front, to the edge. That'll help people. While you're coming, we're going to sing together that song that we were singing at the end of worship. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And as we sing, I want you to lift your hands and just invite. Use this song as an invitation to the Holy Spirit to come and move and minister in our hearts today. Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We condensed a lot. We condensed a lot of thoughts and ideas into 40 minutes today. This is, this is something that I would, if we were teaching this in the evening, I would take about three hours to go through this. But if you can just get a hold of some of these wisdom principles for warfare, it's going to help you. It's going to make a difference in your life. God can fill in the spaces and make it something personal for you, something that God, through the Holy Spirit, will craft and make it very personal for your situation. We're going to take just a minute to pray on some of these issues. I want to ask you if you'll lift your hands and lift your face to heaven now listen maybe that's a stretch for you you don't do that you're embarrassed doesn't matter look around no nobody else cares <laughs> okay so don't be embarrassed but just lift your hands to heaven and say come Holy Spirit we invite you Holy Spirit to come come on just worship him just worship him just lift your voice and just bless Jesus just give praise to Jesus in your own words say Jesus I love you Jesus I love you Jesus I want to serve you Jesus I love you oh Holy Spirit would you come and minister to the people of Jesus 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 we want to pray about these issues of purity we talked about the beautiful white linen that we need to wear before we can think about putting on the armor of God. And Lord, we want to repent today of any of those things we've done which have grieved your heart and which perhaps have given the enemy an open door. We're going to close those doors to the enemy today. We want to repent, Lord. If there's anything that we shared about that you might need to repent of, just voice that quietly to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Who is it that makes you feel condemned and makes you want to slink away from God's presence? It's not God. It's the devil. See, the devil says, you're no good. God's finished with you. But God says to you, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be white as snow. See, God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And I'll be a father to you and you will be sons and you will be daughters to me, says the Lord God. So, Lord, we repent. And you may need to repent today. Maybe it's sexual sin. Maybe it's drug involvement, experimentation with drugs. Maybe it's the occult. Maybe you've been dabbling in witchcraft. Maybe it's that sin of unforgiveness that we shared about. Forgive. Ask God for help. You say, I can't forgive them. I can't forget. Well, the Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus forgave you just because you asked. And God doesn't even remember it. See, God says in his word, I will throw all of their sins into the sea of forgetfulness. And thank God for that. Amen. Let's, let's imitate Christ and let's throw somebody else's sin that has offended us into the sea of forgetfulness today. Maybe you're here today and you say, I don't even know that I have a relationship with God through Jesus, but I want to know God. I want to be clean. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand and I just simply want you in your own words to tell God that you know you've sinned against him and you want to be made clean through the blood of Jesus and have a fresh start in life. And then after we close our service, I want you to stick around and I want you to find one of the pastors or prayer teams that'll be up here and they'll explain to you how you can have your own personal relationship with God. God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Now we're going to pray. I want you to lift up your hands. And I just want you in your own words to ask the Lord. Say, God, make me strong through your power in the power of your might. Father, you've told us to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So, Father, we pray that you would fill us with the spirit. Come on, ask God. Open your mouth and ask God to fill you afresh with his spirit. We need to do it every day. And I know most of us didn't do it today. So let's do it right now. Come on. Father, say, Father, fill me with your spirit. Fill me to overflowing. Come, Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. Today could be your day. Just say, Father, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And maybe you've been filled with the Holy Spirit for 20 years. It doesn't matter. You need to be filled today. That's the issue. That's the question. How full am I today? Not how full of the Spirit I was in 1990. So, Father, would you fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit? Thank you, Lord. I want you to present your hands to the Lord. You don't. You can bring your arms down if you're getting tired, but I want you to present your hands to the Lord. See, King David said, Blessed be the Lord my God who trains my hands for war and he trains my fingers to fight. So I want you to give your hands to the Lord and I want you to ask the Lord in your own words to make you strong in combat, to train your hands to pick up the sword of the word of God again and to have strength in your hands to swing the sword of the word of God against your enemy. I want you to make your arm like this, like a shield, like there's a shield wrapped around it. And I want you to pray in your own words for God to make you strong again. Maybe you've grown weary and discouraged and God says it's time again to pick up the shield of faith and I'll give you strength in your arm that you can deflect the things that are coming at your mind, that are coming at your family, that are coming after your life situation. God says if you pick up the shield of faith, he says you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. See, the devil cheats. Not only does he shoot an arrow on you, he, he sets it on fire before he shoots it at you. And that's not fair. That's words. That speaks in the scripture of vicious words and accusations, the wicked tongue of the devil. Just strike those things down to the ground. Father, each person in here who's been wounded by wicked words, Father, I pray that you take the arrow out and remove that stinger today in the name of Jesus. Now, I want you to place your hands on your head and we're going to pray about the helmet of salvation. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would free your people here right now from condemnation in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in the name of Jesus, we choose to believe what God says, that I am accepted in the beloved. Father, in the name of Jesus, we choose to believe that Jesus has welcomed us into the family of God. I want you to say out loud, I am God's friend. Say, I am God's child. Say, I am God's beloved. Not because of me, but because of the blood of Jesus. I'm filled with his power. I'm filled with his strength. I will succeed and I will overcome in the name of Jesus. Come on, give him a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. More than a conqueror. More than a conqueror. More than a conqueror that exists. He took the word for conquer and he put the word super and hyper in front of it to make up a new word. It's true. You can look it up. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Hallelujah. Your victor is in Christ today. Come on, take the hand of the person next to you. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you so much for your people, Lord God. Thank you, Lord, that you've caused us to be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that your people, that all of us, God, that we'll retain the encouragement that comes from the scriptures, God, to know that at the end of the evil days that eventually come around through our lives, Lord, we can withstand and having done all to stand, we will stand. I pray that you bless your people throughout this week, Father, and cause them to spread the knowledge of Jesus' victory everywhere they go. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you.